Hello, good morning. So I'm Leo Wolf and from Tel Aviv University, and I will be chairing the first uh, session. So we have an exciting session about uh, special synthesis problems. And uh, we will start with one uh, Zoom uh, presentation, and then the rest of the presentations would be from here. So I would like to encourage everyone, both those who are here and those at home, please ask as many questions as possible and let's have a lively discussion uh, for the presentations. So the first speaker who join us uh, in Zoom is uh, Sai Sirisha Ralabandi, who would speak about identifying text-to-speech synthesis with sorry, identifying the vocal cues of likability, friendliness, and skillfulness in synthetic speech. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Sai Sirisha, a PhD candidate at Technical University, Berlin. I have co-authored this paper with Babak Naderi, a postdoc at our chair, and my thesis advisor, Sebastian Muller. In this paper, we investigate the acoustic correlates of the speaker attributes, likability, friendliness, and skillfulness in synthetic voices. Initially, I will spend some time on why did we choose the attributes likability, friendliness, and skillfulness. Later on, I will discuss why did we choose synthetic voices for our studies. Here is the overview of my presentation. Firstly, I will provide some background for my work, followed by the description of the evaluation setup used to understand the perception of the desired speaker attributes. Later on, I discuss the acoustic feature prediction. And finally, I will provide a discussion and conclude with the future work. Coming to the background, traditional evaluation of TTS systems include the subjective metrics such as naturalness and speech quality. Recently, the objective evaluation of these metrics has also been investigated. And additionally, the analysis of cognitive load on the listeners listening to synthetic speech has also been studied. With the improved computational abilities in the recent past, the usage of chatbots and conversational agents has become more prevalent, and it is essential that these conversational agents exhibit certain domain-specific physiological speaker characteristics in the generated speech. Correspondingly, the evaluation of these characteristics is required, and through our work, we provide a framework for evaluation of social perceptions of synthetic speech, and the prediction of acoustic correlates of those social speaker characteristics. There have been a lot of studies in both sociology and psychology in 1940s and 50s to understand the perception of a person from their behavior. The sociology researchers at the Harvard University have come up with a theory that the perception of a person can be done based on two criteria. Firstly, social norms. Secondly, task accomplishment. This theory was further supported by the psychology researchers at both Princeton and Northwestern University. They have also added that the characteristics warmth and competence can be called as the universal dimensions of social perception, as they include both interpersonal relationship and social behavior of a person. However, the participants in all these studies knew the subjects very well. The researchers at Technical University Berlin, Laura Fernandez and Benjamin Weiss were interested in speaker characterization in zero acquaintance scenarios from speech alone. In their research, they found that the big five personality traits were not sufficient for the task that they chose, and they came up with the perceptual factors that can help in identifying the speaker characteristics. The perceptual factors that they proposed were both social and physical, Social factors such as warmth, apathy, competence, and physical factors such as attractiveness. However, all these studies were performed on natural speech. We have performed a similar study on synthetic speech and derived the perceptual dimensions, namely warmth, competence, and extraversion. Uh, that's the theory that warmth and competence are termed as universal dimensions of social perception holds true even in the case of synthetic speech. This was our submission to Interspeech this year. Uh, when we compare the attributes under each of warmth and competence in studies on humans and synthetic speech, we found that friendliness and likability were commonly loaded under the fact of warmth and skillfulness loaded under the fact of competence. Hence, in the current study, as an extension to our previous work, we derive the acoustic features contributing to warmth and competence in synthetic speech. We obtain the acoustic features contributing to warmth by combining the subjective ratings of friendliness and likability. 
similarly the acoustic features responsible for competence through the ratings of skillfulness uh, now let's look at the evaluation setup we have em employed to obtain the subjective ratings for different speaker attributes we have used two commercial TTS systems, namely Google TTS and Amazon Poly. Our study was carried out on red speech with native English speakers. We have combined the individual speech samples into speech segments of length of 20 seconds. These samples were randomized and laid in a loop to the participants until they finished the questionnaire. These are the attributes provided to the participants during the study. We performed a semantic differential scaling test with a continuous 100 point scale. We provide the attribute and its antonym at both the ends of the scale, positive attribute being at the extreme right and the negative attribute on the extreme left. We conducted a crowdsourcing based evaluation on Amazon Mechanical Turk. We chose only native English speakers for our evaluation and the participants were instructed to use headphones and were informed that their responses will be rejected if they won't. Uh, they were also provided with a trapping question during the test to check the reliability of their responses. In our current work, we perform the acoustic feature prediction for the speaker attributes, friendliness, likability, and skillfulness. Here is the flowchart for the same. We initially downsampled the speech segments to 16 kilohertz and derived the open smile features. We derived the Geneva minimalistic acoustic parameter set configuration as it was built to capture the affective speaker characteristics. We have therefore derived 88 acoustic features corresponding to each speech segment of the TTS voice. Later, we perform a linear regression based backward elimination for relevant acoustic feature prediction. We perform this analysis on the 20 second long speech segments separately for both male and female voices. Here are the acoustic correlates of the characteristic warmth. In order to understand the vocal cues contributing to warmth, we look at the acoustic features responsible for friendliness and likability. The results of linear regression along with the explained variance and the corresponding coefficients are provided. Uh, here, are the, here the acoustic feature is the independent variable and the attributes friendliness and likability are the dependent variables. A positive coefficient indicates that for a one unit change in the independent variable, there will be an increase in the perception of the speaker attribute friendliness or likability from that voice, which means there will be an increase in the mean of the dependent variable by that coefficient value and vice versa. We observe that F1 mean is commonly observed as a contributing feature in both male and female voices and unvoiced slope in the range of 500 to 1500 is also commonly found in male friendliness, likability and female likability. Apart from F1 and slope, we found that the feature loudness is a contributing factor for warmth in male. However, uh, we observe that reduced loudness would lead to high friendliness and increased loudness leads to highest likability. Another observation is that spectral flux contributes to warmth in female voices. Uh, let's now listen to the TTS voices from both male and female, uh, which have highest ratings on warmth uh, and lowest ratings of warmth. Mesh wire keeps chicks inside. Hop over the fence and plunge in. The rope will bind the seven books at once. Lift the square stone over the fence. The lazy cow lay in the cool grass. The wide road shimmered in the hot sun. A king ruled the state in the early days. That was the vo male voice with the highest ratings on warmth. Uh, let's now listen to the male voice with the lowest ratings for warmth. A king ruled the state in the early days. The wide road shimmered in the hot sun. The lazy cow lay in the cool grass. Lift the square stone over the fence. The rope will bind the seven books at once. Hop over the fence and plunge in. Mesh wire keeps chicks inside. Let's listen to the female voices. Female voice with the highest ratings of warmth. Mesh wire keeps chicks inside. Hop over the fence and plunge in. The rope will bind the seven books at once. Lift the square stone over the fence. The lazy cow lay in the cool grass. The wide road shimmered in the hot sun. A king ruled the state in the early days. Female voice with the lowest ratings of warmth. 
A king ruled the state in the early days. The wide road shimmered in the hot sun. The lazy cow lay in the cool grass. Lift the square stone over the fence. The rope will bind the seven books at once. Hop over the fence and plunge in. Mesh wire keeps chicks inside. Here are the acoustic correlates of competence in male and female TTS voices. In order to obtain the vocal, vocal cues of the characteristic competence, we look at the acoustic correlates of the attribute skillfulness. Uh, we do not find any acoustic feature that is common in both male and female voices. The vocal cues of skillfulness in female voices are uh, in male voices are lower F naught and higher voiced segment length. Correspondingly, in female voices, the vocal cues are voiced slope, reduced spectral flux, and MFCCs. Uh, let's now listen to the speech samples from both male and female voices with highest and the lowest ratings on skillfulness. A king ruled the state in the early days. The wide road shimmered in the hot sun. The lazy cow lay in the cool grass. Lift the square stone over the fence. The rope will bind the seven books at once. Hop over the fence and plunge in. Mesh wire keeps chicks inside. Uh, that was the male voice with the highest rating on skillfulness. Uh, the male voice with the lowest rating on skillfulness. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Glue the sheet to the dark blue background. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. Rice is often served in round bowls. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Four hours of steady work faced us. Large size in stockings is hard to sell. Uh, let's listen to the female voices. Female voice with the highest ratings on skillfulness. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Glue the sheet to the dark blue background. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. Rice is often served in round bowls. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Four hours of steady work faced us. Large size in stockings is hard to sell. Female voice with the lowest ratings on skillfulness. Large size in stockings is hard to sell. Four hours of steady work faced us. The juice of lemons makes fine punch. Rice is often served in round bowls. It's easy to tell the depth of a well. Glue the sheet to the dark blue background. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. Here we provide the automatic prediction of warmth and competence using the regression algorithms, linear regressor and support vector machine. Uh, for prediction of warmth, we have combined the subjective ratings of the scales, friendliness and likability. For competence, we use the subjective ratings of skillfulness. Uh, we perform a leave one speaker out cross validation. The first block consists of the prediction of warmth in male and female TTS voices. In the second block, we present the prediction performance for the characteristic competence. Uh, the performance of the models is evaluated with the metric mean squared error. Uh, we observe that the performance on female warmth is higher compared to that of on male warmth with the same number of input features. In case of competence, even though the female input features are more than that of the male input features, the MSE scores of female voices are much higher than that of male voices. Another observation we made was that uh, male warmth and competence display a similar performance with a uh, different number of input features. Here is the comparison of our work with that of the studies on natural speech. In our current work, we have only compared our results with that of uh, the studies that were previously performed on natural speech. Uh, literature suggests that the acoustic correlates of various emotions and expressions can be divided into three categories, namely voice quality, timing, and pitch parameters. We observe that the acoustic correlates of social speaker characteristics in synthetic speech can also be categorized into these three categories as in natural speech. Uh, from our analysis, we observed that the acoustic features intensity or loudness, spectral flux, fundamental frequency, and its formants are the common acoustic features in both natural and synthetic voices, contributing to various emotions and speaker characteristics. We have performed the subjective valuation and the acoustic feature prediction on the speed segments of length 20 seconds, which means we might have averaged the acoustic information present in the speed samples. 
And in the current work, the input dimensions we had uh, we were higher than that of the number of training examples during automatic feature prediction. Uh, we have thus followed an instance of backward elimination algorithm, namely recursive feature elimination approach for acoustic feature prediction. Therefore, an extension to this work could be the analysis with a larger data set and unaveraged acoustic information. Another interesting follow-up work could be modification of the TTS output based on the derived acoustic correlates and investigating the speech perception for warmth and competence in the modified synthetic speech. We are also interested in conducting a similar study on natural speech and we want to compare the acoustic correlates that are obtained on natural speech and our current study on synthetic voices. Thank you. Yes, please. I can repeat your question if you would like, but either way. She's online or? Yes. Okay. Um, hello. Uh, so my question is about the uh, difference between uh, natural and synthetic speech. So does the perception of uh, warmth and uh, skillfulness differ between uh, natural speech and what, what is specific in fact to synthetic voices? Do you, did you um, examine, examine uh, this? Yeah, in the current study, we, we haven't, uh, actually, I listened to my own voice, uh, there is an echo. Uh, yeah, in the current study, we haven't performed similar work on natural speech, uh, that is one of the follow-up works which we are planning to do right now. Uh, so there were no uh, works on understanding the social media characteristics. Uh, on natural speech earlier, so I uh, I'm not very sure how the results would vary in case of natural and synthetic speech in this respect. Thank you. Another question is: Could you describe the cultural elements of this study? So currently, you just uh, not just, but you started with English. Um, yeah. Can you can you answer what would you expect in other languages or other accents? Uh, I am not very sure how uh, the cultural uh, um, or the accent of the speech would affect the perception, speech perception. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we haven't done that in our current study and maybe it will be an interesting follow-up work in the future. So hi, thank you for the presentation. I have a question regarding the methodology. I'm, uh, uh, did I understand it right that you use the acoustic features and use linear regression coefficients to identify the important features? Am I right? Yeah, we have derived the relevant acoustic features using the backward elimination algorithm of uh, linear regression, yeah. And uh, in linear regression, if uh, there is a collinearity between uh, the features that we are using, then uh, linear regression produces like this high numbers uh, of, uh, of correlation, positive and negative. And, uh, and did you consider, or, or how can we say that uh, two acoustic features are may, might be collinear or not? Uh, and uh, and uh, among the numbers, we saw some higher numbers and uh, it is quite uh, surprising because usually the intercepts should handle those numbers. So I don't know if you consider these aspects. Uh, yeah, because of the size of the data right now, we couldn't perform a lot of pre-processing on the data we had. Uh, there was a study which was performed on German speech earlier with uh, 100, 300 native speakers speech, and they have uh, actually removed the multicollinearity among the acoustic features. And uh, yeah, for, the, for our current study, because of the limited data set, we couldn't perform a lot of, um, yeah, pre-processing on the data before conducting the elimination. Okay, thank you very much. So another question is that you see the skillfulness is highly correlated with the perception of age. Did you try to remove this factor in the linear regression? Um, I the, one of the observations that we made after looking at the results was that maybe uh, uh, the skillfulness, uh, the highest ratings of skillfulness for uh, voices which sounded much younger than that of male voices could be 
highly dependent on the context and the content. For example, if the person is speaking something with re related to psychology or something like that, then mostly the ratings of skillfulness would be higher uh, for a person who is much younger. But when it is when it comes to a question related to math, maths or something like that, then maybe the voice which has a younger uh, younger voice might uh, get higher ratings. That is what we uh, assumed from the results that we found. Okay, thank you very much. I would like to call our second speaker, Tomash Gabo Chapu, to speak about extending text speech synthesis with articulatory movement prediction using ultrasound tongue imaging. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. In this presentation, I will uh, talk about a feasibility study for predicting articulatory movement of the tongue from textual input. So uh, this uh, presentation is in the, in the context of audiovisual speech synthesis or uh, visual speech synthesis, where the goal is not just to have uh, synthesized speech, but also some kind of uh, facial animation or uh, articulatory information of the, of, the, of the head. There are a couple of uh, previous approaches, like uh, which can be based on images or uh, motion capture based systems and also biomechanical models can be used for this uh, purpose. And um, I have a simple example here on the right uh, with uh, agent-based text-to-speech synthesis with facial animation from Shabu Center's colleagues uh, from a couple of years ago. And you can see that, for example, they were using like uh, marker data and also like a three-dimensional three head was the final output from this. Um, also, if we talk about text to articulation, then um, uh, here I, I would say that we, we are not just interested in the, in the face, but also in the movement of the internal organs, like how the tongue is moving uh, during speech. And for this, of course, we need to have some kind of uh, biosignals. Uh, the goal can be to have uh, like a transparent two-dimensional or three-dimensional uh, talking head, which might be useful for for example, for uh, pronunciation training or, uh, or uh, visual, visual feedback for, for second language learning. And the question is, during this task, is how to uh, move the tongue to produce some specific target sounds. So in the context of uh, text to articulation prediction, there have been a couple of previous uh, studies, like uh, Link and his colleagues uh, applied HMM-based uh, system for text to articulatory movement prediction. They were using a point tracking device, electromagnetic articulography, in which several coids are attached to the tongue. And uh, they were predicting the movement of these coils uh, from the text. And, and the result is a kind of uh, tongue movement. So they, they were able to synthesize the speaker's mouth or, or the tongue movement from text. Also, in a later study, uh, Steiner and his colleagues and, and Le Maguire and his colleagues, they compared HMM and DNN-based uh, speech um, uh, text to articulation. And again, they were using electromagnetic articulography and um, they were now using the three-dimensional um, tongue model. So the idea is that from, from the text, they are predicting both speech and also tongue movement. In, uh, in a most recent study by you and uh, her colleagues, uh, they had a slightly different approach. Now the input is both text and audio, and the target is uh, articulatory movement. So uh, this is a way of combining text to articulation and acoustic to articulatory inversion. They were using like a recurrent convolutional neural network. And so here the final output is synchronized uh, speech, uh, which is not synthesized, but, but regular speech, but also there is a three-dimensional articulatory information and uh, it is integrated into a three-dimensional uh, facial mesh model. So the goal of the current study 
is to uh, do so, something similar like this previous text to articulation approaches. But instead of electromagnetic articulography, uh, I was trying ultrasound tongue imaging for this purpose. The question is whether we can synthesize the tongue movement video from the text in synchrony with the speech, uh, with the synthesized speech. Ultrasound tongue imaging has been used in speech research since the 1980s. And the idea is that um, when we are interested in the, in the movement of the, of the tongue, so in the articulatory information, then this uh, ultrasound transducer is placed below the chin and um, it can be oriented in a couple of ways. Uh, most typically, or at least in the study that I'm talking about, we are using the so-called mid-sagittal orientation. So we have a middle slice of the head and especially what is important, uh, the tongue movement is visible. Um, so like you can see in, on this uh, grayscale image, that uh, the tip of the tongue is on the right and the back of the tongue is on the left. And this uh, white yellow line is the surface of the tongue. The reason why it is visible on the ultrasound image is that um, the ultrasound uh, transducer is put uh, below the chin and the ultrasound waves are going upwards and uh, they are reflected from the, um, from the surface of the tongue where, the, where there is interaction between the air and the, and the tongue. The, one of the advantage of ultrasound tongue images is that uh, it has a relatively good temporal and spatial resolution. So uh, the, um, a large part of the tongue is, is visible. Usually the tip is not fully visible, but most part is, is okay. And also the uh, temporal resolution is around 100, 200 frames per second, depending on uh, how much uh, image we are showing. Uh, I have an example for ultrasound recordings, and also there is there was lip movement recorded for this video. So you can see that uh, the tongue is moving um, in in synchrony with the speech and the lips. I will play it again. Uh, for this study, we were using the Ultrasuit TAL uh, repository, uh, which is from the University of uh, Edinburgh. Uh, it's a free database that uh, anyone can download, and they provide synchronized ultrasound images of the tongue, speech, and lip recording, which uh, all of them are synchronized. It was recorded by the micro ultrasound system of the Articulate Instruments uh, company at 81 frames per second. Uh, this is a large database with many speakers, but uh, from the 81 speakers, we've selected only four male and four female speakers for our study. And each uh, speaker were recorded uh, with 150 to 200 sentences. So roughly we have 15 minutes data for each speaker. <clears throat> the advantage of this micro ultrasound system is that we have access to the raw ultrasound data, uh, which is shown in this, in, in this figure. So when the ultrasound itself is recorded, it works in a way that the ultrasound uh, waves are going upwards and, and they are reflected. And this is recorded in the device. Usually in a medical observation, the, this wedge shape format is, is shown and also for linguistic purposes, uh, usually we are using this representation, but otherwise the, the raw data is uh, represented in uh, 64 scan lines and in each scan lines we have uh, roughly 800 pixels. Uh, so for the, for the current study, we resized the ultrasound images to 64 by 128 and we applied principal component analysis to, uh, to compress uh, the information in the, in the images. And here I'm showing the, the several uh, principal components of, uh, of the ultrasound images. The top is the row representation and the bottom is the uh, wedge representation. So for example, the first PCA component is like the average tongue shape, which is in the like, like a neutral, neutral position. Um, the other parts of the, of the system work in a way that uh, we are using the Merlin framework. And from the text input with deep neural networks, we are predicting uh, acoustic features like for 
standard speed synthesis, and also articulatory features, which are the uh, PCA compressed ultrasound images. And from this, we can create an ultrasound image sequence in synchrony with the synthesized speech. Uh, the text is represented as the Merlin uh, linguistic features with uh, English um, uh, question sets. And the target is uh, partly the acoustic features, which are the word vocoder parameters for excitation and spectrum. And the ultrasound image as the PCA representation. Uh, and both the duration and acoustic models are trained. We were using um, two types of networks um, from the standard Berlin recipes. One of them is a fully connected uh, deep neural network with six layers and 1,000 neurons. And um, of course, uh, early stopping was applied. And also we applied an LSTM with four layers uh, and one LSTM layers. In our cases, we trained speaker-specific models, so all of the data of the speakers were trained independently. Now I will show a couple of uh, demonstration samples. This first image is about how the prediction of the principal component uh, principal components works. So the horizontal axis is the time, and the three columns are the black is the uh, original, the red is from the deep neural network, and the blue is from the recurrent neural network. And so all of these lines, they are basically the uh, principal components uh, of, um, of the ultrasound images. So of, in, the, in the original recordings, uh, they are <clears throat> uh, more uh, noisy. And, and the, in the ones which are predicted by the deep neural networks, they are, they are smoothed. So similarly to the, uh, when the acoustic features are predicted, here there is also a kind of over smoothing um, effect. Uh, with this kind of uh, framework. And also we can see that the last uh, PCA components, they are not really predicted uh, with, with the network, but they actually contain quite few information compared to the first components. <clears throat> also, there are a couple of uh, images uh, as a result of the, of the prediction. Now, again, the horizontal axis is, is the time. The top is the original ultrasound uh, image sequence. The middle is the deep neural network and the bottom is the recurrent neural network. It's quite difficult to show the, the differences across the images. It's better in the video. I will also uh, show that. But for example, if we check like the individual images, we can see that after a while, the tongue is starting to, uh, the tip of the tongue is starting to go up and it's there in the original video and also in the, uh, in the one, uh, which are predicted by the deep neural network. And uh, this is a similar image sequence for a female, for, for a male speaker. Again, the tongue uh, shape is uh, slightly changing across the images and the deep neural networks can predict similar movement. But of course, uh, it's uh, visible that the result of the, of the text to articulation prediction is more like over smooth it. So here the tongue is not as nicely visible as in the original recordings. <clears throat> here again, I selected a part where I found that uh, there is like a clear change of the, of the tongue shape. Okay, so I will show the same uh, image sequences in, in video. The left is uh, the original recording and the right is when it is uh, predicted from the text information. And this first one will be from a female speaker. <clears throat> so what can we see is that in the, uh, in the DNN predicted uh, version, the, mostly the, the tongue is following like the, the original um, recording, but there are a couple of differences. One of them is this over smoothing. The other difference is that because there is no bio biomechanical model or any, any information about the tongue, sometimes we can see like as if there, there are multiple curves on top of each other, which is coming from the PCA uh, rep representation. I will play this again. Clearly, she says she would never resolve such devices. And I have a video from a, from a male speaker. 
Uh, sorry, this was a female, uh, but an, another sentence. And now there is a male speaker. When my kids, they still let the children in the And the last sample. When my kids, they still let the children in the Also, we did an objective evaluation, like we measured the capsule distortion on the on the acoustic uh, features, and also what is more interesting from the text to articulation, we measured the root mean squared error of the uh, ultrasound uh, components, and from this it, it turned out that the LSTM was not uh, not very helpful. So the results with the recurrent network are worse. As a summary. The, I, I have presented a feasibility study for uh, articulatory prediction of the tongue with ultrasound images. So it seems to uh, seems to work. The LSTM, the recurrent network, was not uh, helpful in uh, in this data. Maybe because we have only few uh, data, like two hundred sentences for each uh, speaker. And there might be a question whether we can check the in the final synthesized output whether there is synchrony between the visual or speech output. I, I haven't done any experiments for checking that, but uh, because the acoustic and the articulatory features during the training, they are, they are together, they, the prediction should be okay. But in the future, this could be checked with, for example, SyncNet or other uh, network. And uh, so this result, I expect that they might be useful for audio visual speech synthesis, like to uh, be integrated into some kind of uh, talking head. There are a couple of questions for the future. Um, which uh, might be still useful. Like um, if you listen to the synthesized speech, it was not very natural because the, for the speech data, there is quite a few amount of data. So we could do it in a way that uh, we are pretending on a larger speech corpus and uh, with some kind of multitask training, we are adding the ultrasound uh, in addition after that. So then at least the speech synthesis quality would be better. Uh, also, uh, we plan to do some kind of speaker adaptation or normalization in the future to have uh, to to put together multiple speakers uh, data. And finally, of course, it would be great to integrate this to into a talking head. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. So uh, thank you for, very much for this presentation. In fact, I have basically two questions. Uh, one is about modeling. In fact, there is a synchrony between articulation and, uh, and acoustics because you have a cause and the effect. So how you will cope with this uh, asynchrony problem? And uh, for example, you know, when you have pauses, you have uh, preferatory gestures. Uh, it's well known for lips, but also uh, for, for non-visible uh, speech. And the second is about evaluation. Uh, lip reading, uh, you, you have a, a lot of, uh, uh, we have connected, uh, if you know, this uh, tongue reading, uh, uh, speech communication paper several years ago. So it could be interesting also to, uh, to, to assess, in fact, your system using uh, tongue reading. So instead of just displaying some, some samples to have really numbers, does your tongue contribute the visualization of a, of a tongue uh, uh, could degrade somehow the perception of a, of a, of a synthesis. So you, it, it's interesting to, to check if there is a positive contribution of the display of the tongue to the, uh, uh, to the, to the speech comprehension. So two questions, two answers. Yes, <laughs> please. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, regarding the first one, I absolutely agree that there might be problems with the uh, with the 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 articulatory information and the and the acoustic information because sometimes when we are not talking, I can still move my tongue and there is no speech output. So this is absolutely not handled in this in this system. This is just uh, this was just a very basic idea to test whether uh, with some articular data what can be achieved, and uh, I I don't have a good solution for how this could be done. Maybe like to uh, to skip the silent parts from the speech or um, 
or, or it could be done uh, in a way that uh, we are handling the ultrasound data separately and, and somehow check that uh, we are only use those data when there is significant, uh, when there is both speech and, and tongue movement, maybe. Uh, regarding the, the other one, uh, yes, I also had problems with the evaluations because I, right now for the synthesized ultrasound video, I don't have a good way how to evaluate whether they are okay or not. Also, I, I haven't done any listening test as, as you could see from the presentation. Um, one idea that I was uh, using previously that um, like uh, we could show these, these videos at least to linguist colleagues who, who have experience with articulatory data, they know how the tongue movement uh, should look like and they could evaluate whether this text to tongue movement is, is useful at all. This could be like a first step. And, and after that, there could be um, like, like multiple evaluations with, with those people who are not familiar with the articulatory information at all. So I also have a couple of questions. The first one, you learn shared features between text-to-speech and text-to-tongue movement. Can you notice an improvement in the performance of text-to-speech as a result of uh, training these together? So this is question number one. The second question, what would you guess if you had to predict the tongue movement from the speech, not from the text, would it perform better? Thank you for the questions. Um, for the for the second one, so that is the field of uh, of acoustic to articulatory inversion, and uh, in in previous studies, I was also testing it from to predict from speech spectra features to ultrasound images, and and that also works in a way. I I haven't uh, compared that previous study with this one, so I I don't have a an answer which is uh, which is better, but yes, that can be uh, also done. And uh, the first question uh, is the text to speech become yes. yes, yes, yes. That's um, also something that uh, we could think about. For this, uh, I should like to test it with uh, the with the same framework, but uh, just with uh, the, the speech data or just with the articulatory data. I, I haven't tested it. It was also in one of the reviewers' questions, so that's a that's a future plan. Um, and also, in in previous studies, we were doing it in a kind in a way of like multitask learning. When it is said that uh, if the <clears throat> among the the target uh, there are multiple representations of the of the same information, that might be useful. So I expect that. Uh, it's beneficial to have both articulation as the target, but I haven't tested it. We have uh, one more question from uh, the chat stream. So the question is, uh, why did you use PCA? And did you think about using other features than uh, PCA? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the reason why I was using PCA because like Huber and his uh, colleagues have shown that it works quite well. Um, like it, it was a study in 2007 or around that time with HMM based speech synthesis, but uh, that's a relatively simple representation of the, of the tone movement. And the, so the ultrasound image, despite that they are like 64 by 800, they contain relatively few information and also there is a lot of noise. So PCA seemed to be a simple representation, which was easy to uh, integrate to Merlin. In, in other studies, sometimes uh, we were using like the full ultrasound image, but uh, here I wanted to keep a uh, few features for the articulation. Thank you very much, Tomas. So our next speaker is Martin Langley, who will speak about impact of segmentation and annotation in French end-to-end -end synthesis. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Martin Langley, and today I'm here to show you my work on the impact of segmentation and annotation in French end-to-end -end synthesis. Uh, this paper has been written with Olivier Perrotin and Gérard Barry. Okay, 
here, here is the brief overview of this presentation. Um, I'd like to start by introducing why input data structuring is so important when training text to speech deep neural network. This made us consider that um, some of the data sets that were used in the literature may not be well suited for this application. So that's why we proposed an alternative French data set that may benefit to the training of text to speech networks. I will explain how we ended up with this data and how you will be able to use these two. Um, we, we use this data set to train a slightly modified Tacotron 2 network. I won't go into too much detail about Tacotron 2, but instead I will focus on the addition that we provided to overcome some of the difficulties of this type of network. And finally, I will discuss about how we conducted a multidimensional analysis of the resulting synthesis and how it gave us a better understanding of the multipurpose multi task of judging the performances of a model. So first, let's have a, let's have a few words on what, on what I mean by input data structuring. Okay, something is wrong with the slide, but it's okay. Um, so nowadays, uh, audiobooks are massively used to train text-to-speech networks. In fact, this is not surprising. Uh, audiobooks generally provide tens or hundreds of hours of recorded speech with the corresponding text. The only thing left to do is then to align those data and to cut them into multiple segments called utterances. And um, numerous examples have been done, especially to ease the training of text-to-speech model, MA labs, LG speech or CWIS are some of the most seen examples. Uh, the thing is, the way segmentation is done is debatable and not always clearly explained. Usually, utterances boundaries match punctuation marks, but it's not always the case. Um, let's, for example, take a look at an example from MA Labs. Here, each color corresponds to a different utterance in the data set. In fact, the first boundary cuts in the middle of the first sentence. Here while the second boundary matches the point that stands for an abbreviation. M point stands for monsieur in French, like Mr. in English. Note that none of these boundaries match an actual silence in the speech. Another issue with this corpora is the duration of utterances. Indeed, uh, long utterances may not be the best approach to train text-to-speech models. Um, here are three reasons why. First, high competition memory and power is needed to process large batch size with long utterances. Second, uh, Takaton 2 network uses recurrent units as LSTM, for example, in its encoder, which are known to have trouble learning long-term dependencies with long utterances. And the third reason is that style control via intonation, for example, is massively used to train, uh, um, to, is, um, sorry, massively uses utterance level style embeddings which means that the shorter the returns are, the finer it is possible to control the output prosody at inference time. Thus, we consider that using a shorter segmentation could be better suited to train text-to-speech model efficiently. More, moreover, uh, with audiobooks, utterances are mostly used as is during the training phase. First, this means that utterances are taken independently without taking into account the global text structure of the book. But instead, when recording the audiobook, the speaker intonation is consistent between successive utterances and, for example, tends to drop at the end of paragraph. Highlighting these patterns may help the model to learn them. And secondly, and it may be a more, a more French related issue, silent letters and optional liaisons are very common in French, as well as heteronyms. These situations need more than the orthographic input alone to be disambiguated. The addition of annotations as the end of paragraph marks or phonetic transcripts may help the model to learn the specific patterns. Based on this observation, we proposed a new segmentation of the French dataset MA Labs that will first reduce the average duration of utterances and also add the relevant annotations previously mentioned. To do so, we first aligned the original text from the Gutenberg project with the recording from LibriVox, which is also the original source of the MA Lab dataset. In this new segmentation, utterances were segmented based on silences of at least 400 milliseconds. Almost 95% of these silences coincide with punctuation marks, but it's not always the case. For the remaining 5%, a comma was added at the end of utterance so that every utterance ends with a punctuation mark. If we look at our previous example, the resulting segmentation is given below. 
In this case, silences coincide with punctuation marks, so no comma needed to be added. Here is the comparison of the new segmentation with the original one. The, the, this first figure shows the distribution of utterances length in the two segmentations. The new segmentation distribution is narrower around its mean of 2.77 seconds compared to 6.44 seconds in the original segmentation. Less than 1% of utterances last more than 10 seconds in the new segmentation. Concerning annotations, we introduced the end of paragraph mark in the new segmentation. To be more specific, we added the paragraph mark uh, after the last punctuation mark preceding a curly edge return. Additionally, the phonetic annotation of the whole new segmentation was made. Training the model on both orthographic and phonetic transcripts, which is called representation mixing, not only has been shown to benefit to both transcriptions, but also enables to disambiguate particular issue at inference time without the need for the whole phonetic transcripts of the speech to synthesize. The resulting new corpus that has been enlarged with additional books since the submission of this paper is fully available online with the following link, which is also in the paper if needed. I highly encourage researchers who are working on French synthesis to take a look at this corpus, since much work has been done to make it as clean as possible. Now that we have discussed the importance of, of uh, input data structuring and the new segmentation we propose regarding this, this issue, let's have a look at the modifications that we made to the TACOT12 implementation. As I mentioned before, I don't want to go into too much detail about TACOT12 because I assume that most of the people attending to this talk uh, know this model very well. But in a nutshell, uh, TACOT12 is an encoder-decoder architecture proposed by Ji Chen and colleagues in 2018. The encoder computes a hidden representation of the input sequence, initially an orthographic input. This hidden representation is then consumed sequentially by a decoder with a location sensitive attention to produce mail spectrograms one frame, one frame at a time. The output in mail spectrogram is then turned into waveform via a neural vocoder. Initially, WaveNet was used, but we replaced it by WaveRNN to speed up the process while keeping a very good audio quality. Plus, as I mentioned before, we introduced a mixed embedding matrix to use both orthographic and phonetic input, eventually in the same terms. Another contribution of this work is the addition of what we call a gate loss correction. The gate loss correction is a fine tuning process, process used during training. It has two features. First, nine, nine spectrogram frames are added at the end of each return during training. These frames are ambient silence from the recording, during which the end of sequence probability is set to one. Second, a multiplying factor is added to the gate loss error before backpropagation. This focuses the model on, on the correct detection of the end of sequence. We empirically found that this fine tuning not only corrects some artifacts that appeared otherwise in short appearances, but also enhances the global synthesis quality. We evaluated this implementation when trained with the previously mentioned segmentation. Here are the six models that are being tested. Ho corresponds to the original segmentation provided by MA Labs. N corresponds to the new proposed segmentation with the addition of paragraph marks. And P is the new segmentation with annotation plus the phonetic transcripts. Models annotated with J are fine tuned with the gate loss correction. This experimental setups allows us to evaluate the impact of segmentation and annotation on one hand, and the effects of the gate loss correction on the other hand. 903 returnances were randomly selected and omitted from the training set to carry the evaluation. Uh, please notice that these returnances were common between the original and the new segmentation, so that NNP are not given any unfair advantage during the evaluation, like the use of phonetic or um, paragraph marks, for example. First, we conducted an objective evaluation of the synthesized deterrences. Spectrum accuracy was measured through mean square error between spectrograms and through mean fundamental frequency measurements. Since, since, since synthesis differ in length, uh, spectrograms were first aligned by dynamic time warping before computing mean square error. You can see that the new segmentation, both with and without phonetic, exhibits a slightly lower error than the original with the benefit of the gate loss correction. 
And on the other hand, the new segmentations tend to have a higher head zero than the original. Note that the gate loss correction partially narrows the differences seen with the ground truth, in particular regarding the phonetic, the phonetic model. That being said, spectrum accuracy is an, is an interesting tool to compare synthetic voices to the ground truth to mimic, but it does, it, does not, it does not give us a sense of how voices differ, which is why we were also interested in phrasing measurements as poses duration and speaking rates. Both these parameters refer to the expressiveness of the voice. On the left, mean duration are given by the height of the bar, which is split between speech duration in blue and silence duration in orange. As you can see, utterances synthesized with the new segmentation tends to be shorter than the one with the original segmentation and contain fewer and shorter poses. You see that the gate loss correction helps all the model to get closer to the ground truth. Similarly, the speaking rate largely benefits from the gate loss corrections, but remains higher for the models trained with the new segmentation. These objective measurements show two points. First, the way training data is segmented does impact both spectral accuracy and the phrasing of the model, but in opposite directions. Second, the gate loss correction does benefit to most of the evaluated parameters, which is why for the listening test, we only kept the models that were fine-tuned with this correction. We conducted a, mush, a non online mushra to evaluate these differences Listeners were asked to rate between zero, which is very bad, and 100, which is excellent. The examples that were given for each one of these four models. We found that listeners did not have a general preference for O or P, but N on the other end was significantly less appreciated than the other two models. The reason why no differences can be seen in this graph may be that evaluating voice quality is a tricky question. Several parameters may be taken into account as intelligibility, spectral smoothness, or expressiveness, for example. This is why we figured out that using a multidimensional approach, approach could provide us insight on the underlying parameters that were evaluated by the listener. This approach was also inspired by the work of Simayo and colleagues in 2005. We used a multidimensional scaling, which is basically a way to exhibit uh, consistent proximities between conditions, thanks to the evaluation of pair distances. Two independent multidimensional scaling are, compu are computed. The left one with objective distances, which is the mid square error between mass spectrograms aligned with dynamic time warping, and the right one with subjective distances, which is the absolute score difference from the previous MUSHA. One way to look at this at the subjective graph, for example, is to see the distances between the models at the mean score difference they obtain during the perceptive test, which is, for example, um, about, te about 10 points between O and P, and about uh, 20 points between P and the ground truth. This representation gets even more interesting when you take a look at the correlations between the acoustic parameters previously mentioned and the component of the graphs. Let's uh, take a look at the objective graph first on the left. Here you can see that the first component is correlated with spectrum accuracy parameters as a line spectrum error and mean F0, while the second component is correlated with phrasing and expressiveness parameters as speaking rate and posing duration. Note that the position of the models in this graph is meaningful regarding this consideration. N and P are close to the ground truth on the first component, while O is far which is what we saw with spectral accuracy measurements. And the second component distinguishes the ground truth from synthetic models with all being slightly closer. Note how the gate loss correction helps getting closer to the ground truth in all cases. That objective the subjective graph on the right shows the similar patterns with component one and two being switched. This switch indicates that expressiveness and spectral accuracy are not given the same relative importance in the, perceptive, in the perceptive judgment than in the objective evaluation. Along this presentation, we've seen that data segmentation and annotation impacts both spectrum quality and expressiveness factors, but in opposite directions. To understand why it is the case, it may be interesting to dive a bit deeper into the models to really analyze how this information is learned by the models. 
a better understanding of the hidden representation outputted by the encoder, for example, may, uh, may help us regarding this particular issue. Another important, important contribution of this work is the addition of the gate loss correction, which contributes to both um, prosodic, which, which contributes to improve prosodic aspects of the synthetic speech. The multidimensional analysis highlights the difficulties of the evaluation of speech synthesis, know that the global speech quality has reached such high standards. I believe that more work has to be done to elaborate multiple criteria evaluations. Listeners could be asked to rate several parameters, for example, expressiveness or phonetic accuracy, or and so on. And at the same time, more ob objective measurements need to be elaborated to evaluate this criteria. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, yeah, thank you. I just had, I was wondering about the fact that you said that you segmented on 400 milliseconds of silence, because in my experience, um, that can lead to like really long chunks of speech, um, because people don't always pause for that long, um, and yet you wanted shorter utterances. Um, so thank you for your question. Um, though actually, the 400 milliseconds was chosen because it's roughly corresponds to um, pauses made between speaking terms in conversation in general. And um, actually for our corpus, we found that it led us to shorter utterances. So uh, I actually don't know if uh, this, is a, this can be extended to other corpus or not, um, but uh, it, it helped us for uh, all particular copies. So I have uh, two questions. The first one, can you use multiple segmentations in order to train the network and uh, obtain improved performance? And the second one, can you use the new loss that you suggested on other corpora and see whether they help training, whether this loss helps training? Um, so uh, thank you again for this question. Uh, yeah, actually using uh, both segmentation or using different segmentations during the training phase could help uh, benefit from uh, the benefit to the different aspects that we've seen in this talk. Um, additionally, uh, using both segmentation of the same data uh, could um, um, the, 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 this is not an uh, addition of new uh, training data to the model. This is just different segmentation, which would be interesting to test, yeah, uh, if uh, using both uh, segmentation on the same model could help. And uh, your second question was about the, uh, uh, the addition of an, another uh, error to train the model. Checking the same loss, the loss that you suggested on the other one with other corpora. Yeah. Uh, so we we didn't test it with other languages, but I assume that it should work the same because as uh, all modifications are not uh, um, particular to French. So I I guess that uh, it will also uh, improve results on other languages. So, if you can open the chat, there are two, two more questions over there. They're a bit different. So, so um, how does the model handle large utterances at inference over 20 seconds? Um, um, okay, so um, in our corpus, uh, even with the uh, sorry, um, how does the model handle large utterances at inference over 20 seconds if training data is segmented in small chunks in the proposed ML app set? Is it successful in synthesizing these? Um, so uh, the, in, even in, in the original data set, uh, sentence are, uh, do, do not um, 
um, sentence duration is never over 20 seconds, but we did not have trouble when synthesizing 20 seconds uh, utterances uh, when uh, the model is trained on uh, the small segmentations. So uh, uh, until 20 seconds, it may not be a problem, even when training in a smaller data set. Um, and I see a second question. There can be inconsistency between training and inference stages. Training data was segmented at uh, 400 milliseconds silences, but input text is usually segmented at sentence boundaries, sentence ending punctuation. Did you observe any issue if you turn segmentations as mismatch? Um, So um, first, as you could see in the example, uh, it's not always the case that uh, input data is uh, segmented as at sentence boundaries. Um, but uh, again, when when, uh, when, um, when evaluating or model train on the new segmentation, we did not have any trouble when uh, synthesizing. Uh, example iterances that um, differ a bit from what they seen during the training. So we did not have trouble when, uh, when uh, generating sentences that did not, uh, that are not full sentences, then when generating utterances that are not full sentences. So uh, again, we did not have this type of problem. So I cannot assume for sure that uh, it uh, should lead to any uh, mismatches. Thank you very much, Martin. Our next speaker is Bansi Mark Alpern, who will speak about pathological voice adaptation with autoencoder-based voice conversion. Yeah. Okay. So good, good morning, everyone. All dependent on your current time zone, it might be a different part of the day, but please and take the appropriate greetings. Uh, today I'm going to talk about our paper, Pathological Voice Adaptation with Autoencoder-Based Voice Conversion. And I would say, let's just get started with it. Uh, how do I, how do I start? Did I just, ah. Oh. How do I step backwards, sorry, just. Up doesn't work. Uh, okay, now it works. Sorry. Yeah. So for, first, basically, what we are what we are doing in this paper is uh, synthesizing pathological speech, and you might want to ask the question: Why would we want to do that? And there are three main reasons why we want to pursue uh, synthesis of pathological speech. First, or first and most important motivation is a clinical motivation in the hospital that I'm working, working in, we find that patients undergo a significant stress when they are before an oral cancer surgery or before something like an onset of a speech pathology because they, will, they don't know how they will sound like after, after a surgery or after the onset of this pathology. Therefore, what we would want to do is we would like to decrease this stress by showing them a prediction of how they may, might sound like after, after this operation. Uh, another very important and thing and motivation why, 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 why this voice conversion thing is so important is data augmentation, which is receiving more and more attention because ESR systems for atypical, atypical speech and pathological speech in general are lacking in performance. And having a good dysarthric voice conversion system could enable also data augmentation and serve as a useful data augmentation technique. And the, and, and the last aspect, which is nonetheless an important aspect, is that we have found in other papers that many speech technology, for example, ESR, suffers from fairness issues and accessibility issues, for example, not working for certain dialects of certain speaking styles. 
Therefore, what this paper is also an initial investigation of, of, of this fairness issue by testing whether a modern voice conversion system works for pathological voices. So I can summarize our research questions in, in two main points. The first re research question is, can we co convert the, the voice of a pathological speaker to another pathological speaker of the, of, of the same severity with reasonable naturalness? In other words, is voice conversion technology accessible to people with pathological speech? And how does real pathological speech affect the mean opinion score? In other words, what is the maximum attainable naturalness of synthetic speech? So let me outline my approach first in this slide. And what I will do in the next two slides is basically break down the approach uh, in, into what would, be, what would be the ideal application scenario. And then I will outline how the experiment design slightly differs from that. And basically the key idea, what you have to see in this slide is that there is a, we imagine there is this voice bank where an imaginary or not so imaginary speed sample is take, taken from and we convert into, uh, and this is already a pathological speed sample, which we convert into, again, pathological speech, but now in a different speaking side. In the diagram, the red and orange colors denote the identity of the speakers. And this is an autoencoder-based approach so the conversion process itself is done by the extraction of speaker embeddings. So first, let me outline the application or ideal situation. Uh, in a clinical application, we would like to first find a sole speaker who has a similar speech severity that we think that a patient who comes into the hospital has. Then what we do is then we ask the healthy speaker to provide some recording who is still healthy and we would, write, we would we use this recording to extract the speaker embedding for that speaker. And we use the speaker embedding and this source speaker material to perform the conversion. So what will happen after the conversion process is that we have a pathological speed sample, but now in the healthy speaker side. So this is essentially a dysarthric to dysarthric voice conversion using a healthy speaker's embedding. Now our experimental design slightly differs from that. And the, and, the, and, and the reason for that is that in actual reality, we very rarely have, have a avail, available parallel pathological and healthy speech samples from the same speaker. And therefore, in order to get around that, we make the assumption that the pathological speaker embeddings should be similar to healthy speaker embeddings, which is often not the case, but they should be the case. And the, therefore, we, we evaluate our system on this basis. And basically uh, what we do is to a pathological to pathological speech conversion, but which we can do because we have two pathological speakers with the same severity, but we use the, you do that with a pathological speaker embedding. In order to perform the experiments, we use the UA speech corpus, which is an American English uh, uh, speech corpus with 15 uh, cerebral sparsive speakers and 13 age-matched healthy controls containing around uh, 40 hours of audio data and 500 unique words. It's very important that this is a bird level corpus and voice conversion applications are typically tested with sentence level corpus, that, 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 which is an additional challenge in this data set. Uh, and we basically distribute the speakers into three severity or intelligibility categories low, mid, and high, uh, based on the transcript, on the word rate, which is provided by human listeners who are American English listeners. Yes, so we, we basically uh, assess the speakers in, in this corpus. And, and what we did is we created three speaker pairs who have a similar level of severity. We, ma we match the severity based on the word rate, and we perform the voice conversion both ways on these pairs. And it's very important to state that we do not control for the type of dysarthria and this stuff because there are not enough speakers to do that. And what we found most important in order to have, 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 the, have a meaningful experiment is to have a word error rate uh, first most, which is similar between the speakers because that should be the first descriptor of the severity in our study. In order to perform the conversion itself, we use the HLVQVA3 architecture, which is based on a different paper. 
it's a very nice architecture because it allows conversion of many speakers within one single model and it also allows for non-parallel conversion which is very important in a clinical scenario which i will explain in the next slide why but an also important uh, aspect of that of this architecture that, that it's that it disantagonizes super segmental and super segmental speech features which is important in our case because we want phonetic information to be conserved but prosodic information to be partially changed so i would like to talk a little bit about why non parallel voice conversion is important in a clinical scenario it is because in a in a clinical scenario what we have is an is what we often have is an incomplete voice uh, data collection scenario and an example of that is we have two two patient one patient then complete can recite the stimuli completely, can say uh, red roots, uh, cheese blue and biscuit, while another patient would need to stop basically prematurely. And that would, it, with parallel VC techniques, such a training material wouldn't really give good results, while non-parallel VC techniques allows good results with uh, such a training material. So in order to answer our research questions, uh, we have performed the uh, two experiments. One experiment is uh, uh, a AB similarity test to test for the conversion of the speaker characteristics. And the other, other test is a mean opinion score test to test the naturalness of the speech. To assess the sam samples, we recruited American English listeners. Uh, and uh, we, in, for the mean opinion score test, we tried to take into account uh, the pathologicalness of the utterances by using the VCC 2020 standards, which is a cross-lingual voice, which was a cross-lingual voice conversion challenge. It's which tries to at least account for the fact that there might be pronunciation differences is between the samples. Nevertheless, what we find find in our results is that there is a decreasing mean opinion score even in the ground truth when there is a, an increasing speech severity. Otherwise, we find that the that the mean opinion score of the high and mid severity is uh, is cl is close to the ground truth, but in the case of the uh, of the high intelligibility, we have we we have same similar modes to the original age of VA three healthy speech, but we observe a small reduction because of the uh, most likely this is because the channel differences. So the so the other paper tested the results on twenty five point. Uh, 21.5 kilohertz samples, while the UA speech, the data set we have is a 16 kilohertz corpus, which has, uh, and also because of the decrease in the intelligibility. For the transfer of the speaker characteristics, we can see that in the case of the uh, of the low low intelligibility, high high severity speakers, the the conversion is good. In the in the case of the mid mid speakers the the conclusion is this about the it, the study is inconclusive about the speaker characteristics because what we find that even in the ground truth uh, speakers it was difficult to distinguish uh, between the speakers for the listeners which is very important to note because often in pathological speech we don't really have the luxury that speakers speakers sound different sometimes the speakers just so sound pathological for for the naive listeners therefore the problem itself is sort of imposed to transfer the characteristics and then then in the case of the 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 high high intelligibility results the, the results were, were acceptable uh, i would like to point out now two two limitations of our approach one is that i have already mentioned is that the speaker that we assume that the pathological and uh, and uh, healthy speaker embedding should be the similar for the same speaker in in practice we find that these speaker embeddings could change and we see that potentially this can be worked around with a separate production uh, separate conversion system but but the in, but there is i think a separate discussion to make about whether this speaker embedding should or should not change uh, but which is sort of irrelevant to this presentation and and the and the other limitation is the is that this is a non parallel method which is inherently has lower performance compared to parallel methods but the problem is that some of the parallel methods and the non better non parallel methods are just not suitable for pathological speech because they require a pre-trained ESR 
or TPS model, which is just not available for pathological speakers. So to summarize our paper, we, we demonstrate that uh, uh, even real pathological speech affects the perceived naturalness of speech, which sets an upper bound on the achievable mean opinion scores for VC speech. The performance of the voice conversion is comparable to the performance of the age of VQ VA3 approach observed with typical speakers. And the resulting speaker similarity is high in the case of low, acceptable for high, and inconclusive in the case of mid intelligibility. High end VC techniques usually require parallel data or ASR bottleneck -like features, both of which are not readily available for pathological speakers. And we believe this is currently the greatest obstacle towards pathological voice conversion. And thank you for your attention. So I have a first uh, question. And um, I actually view the fact that you use the same embedding for pathological and for healthy as an advantage because you can think about an application where you convert from the pathological to the healthy for the same person. Mm -hmm. Did you consider this application? So, so uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah th th thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a, it's a good question. Yeah, so we have test, test, tested with converting to pathological to healthy. Uh, that application also generates a lot of interest, but that's a sli slightly different application. Uh, there is a separate study uh, which have tested this. And in general, uh, what the, this non pro voice conversion process is useful is the transfer of, of, the, of the speaker characteristics and not improving the, the intelligibility itself. I would say having a plural method which improves the intelligibility in the first stage and then ha or having a TTS method which improves the intelligibility in the, in the first stage. For example, the Pyrostrom model is a good example of, of that where, where intelligibility can be improved and then the speaker characteristics could be changed later in, in, in a voice conversion model. I don't know if that answers the question. Any other questions? Yes, please. Did you test uh, uh, it with uh, like real users, real people uh, in a larger amount? So what was uh, like the real user's reaction uh, to the situation? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So the real users in this scenario, so I, I have outlined, I think, two scenarios where would be actual users. The first scenario would be the clinical scenario. In a clinical scenario, we haven't tested it yet with users. We have tested it with naive listeners. And the main reason for that is that we still need to do the data collection, which could be do which 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 would which is required basically for the meaningful testing of this process procedure. For the data augmentation, we have run certain tests and we see that in certain conditions it does improve compared to uh, baseline non-augmented scenarios, the perf performance of the word error rate. Um, just a general discussion about uh, voice, uh, voice prints. Um, there is a debate about uh, uh, to say the can we recognize people from their voice? When my mobile telephone to me, sometimes I don't uh, recognize her. So especially for biopathological voice, mm. if you don't know the person, it's very difficult. So perhaps you can ask relatives. Mm. So this idea of uh, using subjective testing for for, uh, for assessing voice print in prints, it's, it's very difficult. I think it's really easy. So what do you think about this? The general uh, question. I, th I think in our study, what we see is... Okay, just repeat the question of people that some did it hear it and then ask it. Repeat the question. Uh, okay, so how could I summarize the question? The qu question is, is that uh, if we... The, 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 how, I think how I would interpret this question is how to evaluate uh, speaker similarity in the case where 
it's it's very difficult to recognize the speaker itself. That's 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 how I would have, would uh, summarize this question. And in our study, I, I think the design of the A-B test really helped that because we have also tested for the condition where we're comparing the ground truth speakers. And so in certain scenarios, we did find that they couldn't distinguish the ground truth speakers from each other. Therefore, there the problem is, as, as you say, fundamentally ill-posed. But I, I, I think that there is a good point there that, that, that you are making, that, so, that sometimes it's really dependent on Sometimes it could be really dependent on who is listening to the corpora. And I think in, the, in this design, I, I agree on the point that it would be really important to ask parents or, or some other people who would be more familiar with, 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 with the voice or, or relatives. Uh, also, I would have to point out that there, that there is a bias issue there that they would say that even if it's not the same voice and but it looks the similar, but sounds the similar, it's good enough for them. So. You could have you could say that they are better recognizers, but to a certain extent they might also have a lower tolerance uh, because they they know the, the person. But this I agree, this is a good point as this needs to be investigated. So there, there is one more question on the chat. So how different is your method from voice cloning? Can voice cloning pipeline be applied to this use case? I actually don't understand the question, but maybe you do. Mm. So I'm, I'm not sure what's the difference between voice cloning and voice conversion. Is voice cloning text-to-speech text share version? I'm not sure. Yeah, if, if, I, if I would have to guess the difference between what, sometimes voice conversion is called voice cloning, but also some people say that, that voice cloning corresponds more to one-shot voice conversion. And uh, in general for pathological speech, I, I found one-shot voice conversion to be not working so well. That's why we have tried to pursue other approaches. But my impression on voice cloning approaches is that they usually work on the kind of training data that the, the, the original model is trained on and cannot really just extrapolate into, into ex, like true extravagant boundaries. So if you train a healthy, healthy free model, healthy TTS model, and try to use that to get pathological speech, that often just doesn't work because the model doesn't have an understanding of pathological speech. Thank you very much, Bante. The next uh, speaker and the last one for this session is Elijah Gotirez, who would speak about location location, enhancing the, the evaluation of text-to-speech synthesis using the rapid positive transcription paradigm. So hi, everyone. Um, so I want, I'm Elijah Gutierrez and our paper I was on enhancing text to speech evaluation with the rapid prosody transcription paradigm. So, today, modern TTS systems uh, are getting closer to human parity. And recently, a lot of work has gone into uh, trying to achieve controllable prosody, but not as much work has been done on evaluating whether this prosody is actually appropriate uh, in a given context. So, we wanted to ask ourselves how can we get more out of subjective evaluation? Because currently, the mean opinion score test or MOS test uh, only really provides a general measure of quality. Uh, we can't pinpoint where errors are occurring in synthetic speech. And as a result, it's becoming more and more difficult to identify uh, subtle differences between state of the art systems with the MOS score alone. So I'd like to play two examples of uh, the neural, two neural systems saying the same thing. I saw him slip a card from his coat sleeve. I saw him slip a card from his coat sleeve. So as we can see from those examples, it's quite uh, difficult to tell these neural systems apart. And we can imagine that uh, non-expert listeners would have trouble uh, making meaningful judgments about these voices if all they had at their disposal was the MOS score. So uh, in an effort to diversify the available evaluation protocols in TTS and also address this sort of ceiling effect that we're observing, uh, we wanted to propose um, a new paradigm based on the rapid prosody transcription task or RPT. Uh, introduced uh, initially by Jennifer Cole and her colleagues. So RPT is a real-time annotation task 
where participants mark uh, prosodic prominences and boundaries in an utterance, uh, usually at the word level. And essentially, we repurposed this task for TTS evaluation, but instead of asking participants to uh, mark prominences, we asked them to mark errors instead. And uh, RPT is useful because it gives us a probabilistic representation of where perceptual errors uh, actually occur in speech. And it also gives us some insight into how non-expert listeners uh, perform their evaluations because um, the task is done in real time. So we had a few um, overarching guiding questions for our research. And the first is about specifying the MOS task from naturalness to prosody. And we wanted to see if doing this had any sort of effect on listener evaluations, because uh, we believe as we're moving towards um, evaluating prosody in context, we believe that uh, it makes sense to um, evaluate the prosody of an utterance as opposed to a broader characteristic like naturalness. And this links in with our second question, which is about leveraging linguistic knowledge for TTS evaluation. Um, because uh, as we know, uh, achieving appropriate prosody is quite a difficult task. And it's one that relies a lot on substantial knowledge from linguistics like discourse structure and information structure and pragmatics. And so we wanted to um, show the importance of incorporating this uh, knowledge uh, into eva designing new evaluation procedures. And finally, because we're using uh, the RPT task, uh, we wanted to see what sort of uh, useful information that it can actually give us uh, about the differences between TTS systems and also how listeners evaluate them. So to answer these questions, um, we had uh, we compared uh, three systems across three conditions. So we had uh, a baseline unit selection system festival, and we had two neural systems, uh, Ophelia and FastPitch, which were both trained on the LJ data set. And in total, we recruited 120 non-expert participants with prolific. Um, and essentially, we so we had three conditions. And for the first two, we had 30 uh, participants in each. And for the third condition, we had 60. Uh, so the third condition was larger in scale, just to show that the paradigm was also scalable. Uh, and because this is a lot of evaluation work, we uh, distributed uh, the work through a Latin square design to mitigate listener fatigue. So just a little more about the structure and interface of the experiment. So this is from the LMEDS interface developed by Tim Mart, and we customized it slightly. So for E1, uh, this is the standard MOS test. Uh, so participants were asked to rate the naturalness of a stimulus. And here we have the standard five point uh, naturalness scale. And uh, what's important here is the stimuli we used. So we used uh, audiobook data from um, the Libre TTS corpus and they were randomly selected. Uh, so this is what would have traditionally been done essentially in a, in a traditional MOS test. Uh, and here is uh, our procedure. Uh, so this is the second condition E2 and uh, we've upgraded uh, the MOS test slightly and we have three subtasks. So the first is uh, as we see the RPT task uh, where listeners can mark uh, the words there. Um, and then the following task is a rating task, but it's not the same as the first uh, condition, which is a naturalness rating. This is a prosody rating. Uh, and finally, we um, have a brief error type identification task where we ask listeners to um, indicate the sources of the errors uh, in, in the signal that they were are listening to. And finally, we have E3, which is a setup the same as E2, but uh, the only difference is that uh, the stimuli were different. So rather than isolated sentences, we used question answer pairs that were generated with a template based approach. Um, so the idea was that questions would uh, constrain the prosodic structure of the response part. And so we could get um, more, more predictable prosody and evaluate um, the appropriateness of systems uh, in, in a more consistent manner. And again, uh, the rest of the task is essentially the same as E2. So just as a quick sum up um, of, of our setup, we have E1, which is this traditional MOS test. So it used uh, Libre TTS uh, stimuli and it wasn't augmented with our procedure. Uh, E2, uh, like E1, used Libre TTS stimuli, but it was augmented with our procedure so we could compare uh, the difference between the prosody ratings and the naturalness ratings from E1. And finally, for E3, um, like E2, it was augmented with the RPT task, but uh, we used different stimuli. Instead of isolated sentences, we used question answer pairs. So for our results, now we can divide them into three parts because there were three subtasks. So the first is the PMOS and MOS scores. Um, the second is the error heat maps that we get from the annotation data. And finally, the error type data from the identification task. Uh, and for future reference, when I talk about PMOS, I'm talking about prosodic MOS. So that's the um, prosody rating as opposed to the ordinary naturalness rating. And so here we have uh, the PMOS and MOS score distributions. And we see from E1 and E2 
uh, that we get the same system rankings. So Fast Pitch uh, came in first with Festival last. And uh, for E3, we can see that the ranking uh, was slightly switched between the neural system. So Ophelia came out uh, on top there in instead. Uh, but what's interesting is that we can see that there's an absolute difference in MOS scores. Um, that the absolute difference in MOS score, sorry, is actually greater in E1 than it is in E2 and E3. Uh, in fact, the difference there is statistically significant, whereas for, the, for E2 and E3, uh, it's no longer significant. Um, and this shows that a simple shift in focus uh, from naturalness to prosody does have an impact on listener valuations, um, in that uh, the listeners had more trouble uh, discriminating between the neural systems in the latter experiments than they did in E1. And by extension, it shows uh, that the difference between the neural systems uh, in E1 is likely not due to more correct prosody generation from fast pitch, but just uh, overall better synthesis quality. And so if you move on uh, to the, our air heat map, so first we can see, uh, of course, that festival, as we'd expect, uh, garnered more errors in total. But what's interesting is if you look at the neural systems uh, where they did make errors were um, on words preceding punctuation. Uh, and this is especially the case for fast pitch, where every word in this particular stimulus uh, preceding punctuation was marked at least once. And what this shows is that um, listeners were quite sensitive to uh, major prosodic boundaries, as uh, denoted by punctuation in text. Uh, and it shows uh, that this was uh, a main concern that they had uh, while listening to the synthetic speech. Uh, so you might get a better idea if I play uh, the sample. So first we have Ophelia. Also, a draft on futurity sometimes honored, but generally extended. And fast pitch. Also, a draft on futurity, sometimes honored, but generally extended. So uh, I don't know if you noticed, uh, but I hope you did, that uh, fast pitch was uh, significantly more expressive in its prosody than uh, Ophelia. Um, there was a little bit of a sing-song prosody near honored. Uh, so this again shows that um, clearly uh, the listeners were um, attuned to these uh, major prosodic boundaries and uh, the instant that uh, these systems got those boundaries wrong, uh, they marked it and flagged it up uh, accordingly. And we get a similar story for the question answer pairs. So here we have um, an example of, of corrective focus. Uh, so here the question is, did John eat the cupcakes? And we would expect the response to be, no, Holly ate the cupcakes. So we would expect corrective focus on Holly. Uh, and, and here again, we see a, uh, the same trend as uh, the past stimulus where fast pitch has more errors uh, on words preceding the punctuation than Ophelia. But what's also interesting is that uh, the subject Holly for fast pitch was marked um, at least once, whereas Ophelia, uh, it, it wasn't marked at all. Um, and if we give um, the samples a listen again, I'd like you to pay attention to the fast pitch one in particular. So this is Ophelia again. No, Holly ate the cupcakes. And then fast pitch. No, Holly ate the cupcakes. So we can make uh, more sense. Again, we can see that uh, the fast pitch uh, sample was more expressive than the Ophelia one. And we can see this more if we look at the F0 contours in conjunction with the heat maps. So uh, here we see in the fast pitch sample that there's a big excursion on that initial no. And while it doesn't really have any information structural clashes, um, there's not enough context to, to justify this big an excursion. So uh, this was uh, perceived as unnatural. Um, but what's interesting is the extra prominences on cupcakes. So this uh, shows the usefulness of uh, the question answer pairs because we can actually um, compare the uh, expected prosodic realization with the actual uh, prosodic uh, structure that was realized by the, by the systems. And here we see that um, because there were these extra prominences on cupcakes from fast pitch, these uh, did have a clash with listener expectations where they would have been expecting the corrective focus to fall on Holly. Uh, and on the flip side, because here we see uh, that Holly didn't actually get prominence, it was produced with a flat tone that was also flagged as a sort of secondary error because um, it, that also clashed with listener expectations. And if you compare that with Ophelia, which has a falling tone for Holly, um, that would have been much more acceptable. And uh, as a result, that's why we don't see any error marks on, on Holly. So clearly, um, fast pitch uh, or the neural systems are sensitive to punctuation and fast pitch um, in particular, but we wanted to quantify this effect. So we actually calculated the rate at which a word preceding punctuation uh, was marked at least once. And we see over both experiments that fast pitch was indeed marked more often. So at 73% of the time in E2 and 60% of the time in E3. 
Um, but we see that the gap between Ophelia and fast pitch is actually greater in E3. So this effect uh, is, is more significant in, in E3, where the stimuli had more uh, constrained prosodies. Um, and this just goes to show that, again, punctuation was a more salient issue for fast pitch than it was for Ophelia. Uh, and as an aside, uh, we also wanted to see how the error annotation data related with PMOS. So we calculated the error rate, uh, and that's just uh, the proportion of words in the utterance that were marked with at least one error. And we see if we rank um, the systems based on this measure that it reflects the system rankings that we obtained uh, from PMOS. And uh, this shows that the error rate as a measure is useful as a metric to corroborate um, PMOS scores, but not, not only that, it's also useful in its own right, because it actually turns out to be better than PMOS at discriminating between the neural systems in E3. So there's less variance there um, for Ophelia. And finally, we have the error type data. So uh, just for a little bit more information about uh, where the errors, uh, what, what in the signal uh, actually triggered those errors. And um, for E2, we see that the festival had the most issues with abrupt changes in pitch, while the neural system struggled most with unexpected intonation. And this makes sense considering their architectures because festival is a unit selection system. So it's prone to bad joins and, and bad signal processing. Whereas the neural systems, uh, they're more concerned with uh, achieving um, correct prosody. So uh, that, that showed in there um, because they garnered the most errors under unexpected intonation. Um, but what's interesting is that if we see uh, the results for E3, um, just by virtue of changing the stimulus type from isolated sentences to question answer pairs, uh, we actually see a shift in listener evaluations um, for festival. So we see that um, festival here struggled most with unexpected intonation. So to some extent, it, it seems that um, the listeners were able to look past the bad joins um, and, and actually separate out the prosody and evaluate that on its own, uh, just by virtue of uh, the stimulus type changing to having more uh, constrained prosodic structure. Uh, and again, uh, if we look at the neural systems in E3, we see again this trend that uh, fast pitches um, has this overexpressive prosody compared to Ophelia um, because we see that it garnered a, a lot more uh, errors actually uh, under unexpected intonation than, than Ophelia did. So how do our results actually tie in with our questions? So, we saw the uh, from the PMOS score distributions this sort of ceiling effect uh, that listeners are having more trouble discriminating between the neural systems, uh, and it shows that the difference between these state of the art systems is less clear when it comes to prosody, and this actually supports the case for finer grained error analysis as we've done uh, in our procedure, uh, especially as TTS voices become more and more expressive. And regarding the linguistic knowledge that we leveraged uh, for our uh, study. So by designing these template-based uh, QA pairs, um, we manipulated the information structure uh, of, of an utterance, and we managed to constrain uh, the prosodic renditions that were appropriate uh, to the utterance. And so uh, as a result, we were able to compare the neural systems, especially uh, much more systematically, uh, because we knew exactly where we expected a prominences to fall. Uh, and we also saw that the neural systems, um, and Philia in particular, I believe, uh, were, I know, fast pitch, sorry, were, were variable with these sort of prosody and context stimuli. Uh, and this is actually consistent with our agreement statistics, but uh, if you want the full details of that, you can refer to the paper. Uh, but the key takeaway message is that diverse test sets are important for TTS evaluation. Um, these neural systems, they were built with and, and for um, audiobook data. So we use these Libri TTS corpus isolated sentence data. But as we move towards evaluating prosody in context, it's important to, again, draw from uh, various knowledge from, from linguistics in order to model uh, contextual information and design uh, procedures and stimuli that are tailored uh, to, to prosody in context. And finally, um, we saw that the error heat maps do give us uh, a lot of uh, useful information. Uh, first, from the location of the errors alone, we saw that the listeners pay close attention to major prosodic boundaries when they're listening to synthetic speech and they're rating prosody. And um, we, can also, we also saw that uh, differences between the neural systems can be described with much greater precision compared to a MOS score alone. We can actually interrogate the annotation data for further analysis as we did uh, for the fast pitch and Ophelia samples. Uh, when fast pitch was showing uh, a trend of overexpressivity near prosodic boundaries. And finally, uh, we can also use the error heat map um, as a measure of system quality uh, in its own right uh, that can either complement PMOS or stand, stand on its own. 
Uh, so in conclusion, we've proposed an evaluation paradigm that augments the standard MOS test. We, were, uh, we showed that we were able to uncover the locations of prosodic errors and highlight the weaknesses of a system. Uh, through E3, we showed that um, the, the paradigm is scalable, but also that it's feasible because a lot of the feedback we got from the participants was quite positive. Uh, they said they remained uh, engaged throughout the task and they just found it genuinely interesting. Um, and we believe that uh, this could uh, partially uh, address the issue in TTS evaluation that we see concerning uh, a loss in attention uh, as, as tests get pretty long. Uh, and finally, um, we'd like uh, to extend uh, the, the paradigm to other areas in positive evaluation like speaker stands and speaker intent. So these are just some uh, preliminary suggestions for future work. Thank you for listening. Uh, I look forward to your questions. Hi. Um, you talked a little bit about um, the importance of the test data when you're evaluating. I was wondering if you also needed to look at the training data, um, because as you said, you use LJ speech, but then you're testing it on question answer pairs. So I was wondering if you had question answer pairs in your training data, whether that would be, um, it would be better able to maybe synthesize some of these um, scenarios yeah yeah um so essentially yes but uh, that is the lesson that we were trying to um to learn so so we were trying to uh stress the fact that um all too often uh the the data we use in, in tts is, is this audiobook data and, and there's this um skew towards towards using this sort of data but um yeah what, what's important is um to use this sort of context uh, or yeah, this concept context uh, sensitive stimulus. And actually we didn't uh, manage to uh, uh, train um, our, our, our models on this, on this sort of data, but yeah, we would definitely uh, want to do that for, for future work. Um, I, I think, yeah, it, it would do better, but uh, the issue is that um, we don't think that this is being done often enough. So there are a few questions in the chat. My question would be that uh, in uh, the samples you showed statements and uh, what about questions or other modalities? How would you employ that part? Because it's especially critical in training neural systems. Yes, so um, for our context answer pairs, yeah, we, we focused on, on the answer part, but uh, we could also of course, synthesize uh, the, the context uh, part. But um, what we wanted to bring attention to is that, yeah, uh, the, the training data uh, used since they were audiobook uh, sentences, um, we, we focused particularly on statements, but other modalities, um, yeah, we, we should definitely look into, into other modalities as well, of course. Um, So let me combine two different questions from the chat. So the first one is, are you planning on releasing uh, the tools that you use because it seems to be very useful for uh, other researchers? And the second one is, so now that you see that MOS is not highly correlated with their prosody, what other factors would you like to bring in as next steps into this tool set when developing your evaluation method? Um. Well, uh, there's a lot to explore. So, I mean, one example would be um, maybe emotive synthesis. So uh, we could look at um, what sort of emotions um, and, and affect uh, are being um, uh, experienced by the listener as, as they rate a stimulus. And uh, we also actually want to extend it to long form synthesis. So uh, we could have a, a paragraph uh, of speech and because it's done in real time, listeners could just easily mark uh, the words as they appear. Um, and uh, as for the release of the tools, uh, yeah, I was planning to upload that uh, to my GitHub uh, and I can definitely post a link at some point. 
Uh, I think it, it is uploaded to my GitHub, but um, it's just on a, a private repository. I'll have to uh, sort out the documentation and all that, but it should be, it should be good. Thank you very much, Elijah.